Okay, guys, good morning. Welcome back. It's uh, Wednesday, March 10th, and we still have about three minutes to go till class time. So, hope you guys had a good couple of days and um, just get comfortable. We'll be starting a few. It was nice to just have a few free moments with the uh, peach here. Mm -hmm. Hey, Sebastian, welcome back. All right, welcome guys. Good to see everybody. Good morning. Hi, Zachary. <clears throat> Just another minute or so, and then we'll get rolling here. So it's pretty funny. My, uh, my brother, Danny, I posted an Instagram photo yesterday of a uh, of Peachy, you know, just laying around the house, and uh, it was cracking me up because he's saying that she looks like a Dr. Seuss character, like the Grinch or something, with her like belly, because she kind of has like a little bit of a pop belly going on. And I've just been laughing every time I look at her now because I went back and looked at you know photos of the Grinch from the old Dr. Seuss, and like she does kind of look like him, or the Cat in the Hat maybe. <laughs> Hi there, Chase, Zoe, McKenna. Everybody else, good to see you guys as usual. Peachy, run along. Okay. <clears throat> good morning. Hi, Sydney. Okay, guys, so it's pretty much 10 now. I'll let things get started. Welcome back. Um, so let me just make sure we're all uh, up to speed on a few things about the overall class. Um, I'm working through your guys' essays. I'll be done with them in just a few days, certainly before the end of the weekend, they'll all be graded. So um, over the weekend when I'm ready, probably around Saturday or something, I'll send a class-wide notification on Canvas that the grades are done. And from there, um, any student can just email me to request their grade and any comments, and I'll send you your written comments and grade. Um, other than that, we have our midterm coming up next Friday. That's the last day before spring break. So I'm, I'm also going to send the study guide um, for the midterm exam. <clears throat> I'm going to send that later tonight or tomorrow morning, so you'll have some time to look at it and kind of prepare your notes and get your study going. Um, next week on Monday and Wednesday, we have two review sessions. So we're just going to use two full class periods to go over and review all the different topics in the study guide, get all your questions answered, and um, get your notes prepared so you'll be able to have a good, successful midterm next Friday. Um, so just letting you know a couple of things that are upcoming in our calendar as we continue through the semester. I'm sending your study guide to every student through Canvas in the next day or so. And over the weekend, I'll be finished with the first essay grades. And then we just look forward to the midterm. Um, and then you have the spring break, and then it's back from there to the second half of the semester. Um, the last essay that we're going to go over is the one that we're going to start on today. So I have two meetings for this essay of The Trolley Problem by Judith Thompson. So we're going to look at that today and Friday. And then next week, Monday, Wednesday, we have a review session. And Friday next week is the exam. So just kind of keeping our mind on the schedule. These are all listed dates in the syllabus. But as we approach the key dates, I kind of want to make sure to check in with you so that we're all clear about it. 
So anyway, last thing about that, just to summarize again, I'm sending the study guide in the next few days. Make sure to check your Canvas notifications um, and, and open it up so you can gain access to it. And then over the weekend, I will um, mail out a note that I'm done with the first essay grades. And from there, students should just contact me individually for their graded comments. OK, guys, so <clears throat> and as usual, if there's ever any questions or comments or anything else about um, what we're doing here, feel free to let me know any way, any way you can, whether it's in the chat or through email or during office hours or whatever. OK, so uh, first thing, though, before we move on to this last essay in our first half of the semester is I want to wrap up the comment about Garrett Hardin's essay that we started on and that we were finishing with last time. So we reached this debate in our semester about global um, haves and have nots. Do we have any kind of moral obligation to assist the third world poor? Uh, different views. Um, are out there on this question. Peter Singer thought we do have the moral obligation to assist the global poor. The essence of his argument is kind of simple in a way that we have a surplus wealth beyond necessity, but many people in the world live beneath baseline necessity, not having enough income or wealth to, to meet the needs of food, clothing, and shelter. So couldn't we divert some of the surplus wealth to them without undermining our own well-being in any significant way? And he thinks that that's a moral obligation because absolute poverty is very harmful to human happiness, and if a person's a utilitarian, they want to do their best to try and promote the maximum overall human happiness. Um, he considered a whole range of objections, and then we moved on from that. Garrett Hardin has the opposite argument. He says that we don't have a moral obligation to assist the global poor. So let me just say a few points of summary about his whole argument, and then we'll be able to close that topic. Um, he starts by saying that he's not a fan of the spaceship Earth metaphor that was popular at the time he wrote this in the 70s among environmentalists. Why doesn't he like the spaceship Earth metaphor? Well, one reason he doesn't like it is because he thinks it implies that we all have an equal share, um, an equal right to an equal share of the world's resources. The metaphor says this is one home that we all live on, like a big spaceship kind of, and therefore we should all um, not use waste or destroy more than our fair share of the resources of the planet, whether that's an individual, an institution, or a nation that's using these resources. But Garrett Hardin says, this is not a good metaphor because, first of all, if we really shared all the resources equitably and equally, that would destroy all the accumulated wealth and prosperity that makes some parts of the world these beacons of, you know, um, of hope and economic opportunity. And <clears throat> he says a real ship that was a spaceship would have to be run by a captain, but there's no central governing authority over the planet Earth. There's just a bunch of sovereign nations. Um, so this is not like a spaceship in the sense that there's no captain either. So what's the better metaphor? He says, use the lifeboat metaphor. The lifeboat metaphor is one where we are to imagine that each wealthy nation is symbolized by a lifeboat floating in the ocean. And um, so there's like lifeboat USA, lifeboat Germany, France, Japan, Britain, Canada. The first world industrialized economies are represented in the example by lifeboats. And the passengers on the lifeboats stand for the citizens of those wealthy nations. So people that are on board, like Lifeboat USA, that's us, pretty much, citizens of the United States. In the example, there's also people in the water, and he you know, describes these as to symbolize and stand for the third world poor that are starving in the third world. Um, so they're in the water. Clearly, they don't have the same kind of safety, security, and hope for survival as the people that are currently on these lifeboats. They are looking to those that are on the lifeboats for some kind of lifeline, assistance, help, or even gaining access to the boat itself. So what should we do? He says, imagine that on the boat that we are on, there's 50 people and a capacity for 60. In the water, there's 100 that are looking for some type of help. And that's to sort of reflect the relative distribution or ratio of wealthy to poor nations around the world. You have one third wealthy nations, two thirds poor. So from this standpoint, he says, what would be the right thing to do or the wise or practical thing to do concerning those that are in the water asking for our help? He says, if you felt like we should help all 100 and bring them all on board, uh, then that would cause the boat to sink. So he says that's not feasible, even if you know some people might feel like that's the just thing to do, because um, it would destroy the ability of the boat to serve anybody's needs if it was um, overwhelmed by passengers. Again, like I said last time, I think, I'm not so sure how this can exactly model the situation that he's trying to argue for, that we shouldn't give assistance to the poor, because bringing people onto the boat sounds to me like um, a, an argument in favor of not having permissive immigration or something controls. Um, so I feel like he's kind of a little all over the place with this example. To me, it's not perfectly 
uh, in alignment with the kind of real world factors that he's trying to compare it with. So, so that's one issue. But anyway, what if we just let 10 on from the water? He says there's still issues with that because it maximizes the capacity of the boat, therefore eliminating the critical safety margin that you have when you have some excess room. So he advises instead to just not let anybody on, diligently guard against those that would arrive onto the boat. And that's the only thing he thinks that ensures the continued prosperity and survival of those that are already passengers. He knows many people will feel guilty about that or think it's abhorrent, but he says, if you are that guilty, then why don't you just get off the boat and let someone else take your place? Once again, something that I think is just rhetoric and kind of getting off the rails from like a real um, example that speaks to something that we could do in the real world. But, um, but there you have it. That's why he thinks that we should not be so generous to the third world poor because there's too many people of that kind. And he also thinks that uh, we don't necessarily help a problem when we feed into the population growth of the third world through the aid. That's what he talks about next. He talks about the different rates of reproduction in the first and the third world. Um, in the third world, for a number of socioeconomic reasons, reproductive rates are much higher. And so the number of years that it takes for the third world nations to double in size is is much faster than in the first world. The rough number is that every 35 years or so, population would increase by a factor of two in the third world, but it takes about 87 years for population to double in the first world. So he says, if we assigned ourselves a philanthropic burden of giving donation from 100, sorry, from 300 million donors in the first world to 300 million recipients in the third world, the ratio of donors to recipients would not remain at a stable one-to-one -one ratio over an 87 year span. Because in that 87 years, while the population of the first world donors has doubled, the population of the third world recipients has doubled, doubled, and halfway doubled again. So what started as a one-to-one -one ratio of donors to recipients becomes more like one to four or even worse. So he says it's an unsustainable practice to inflate the population size of the third world through the provision of aid. And in fact, that is just ensuring a worse scenario in the future when the cohort of people has grown so large and then inevitably the the charitable aid system has to be withdrawn because it's unmanageable. Now we withdraw it from a much larger cohort of people and it produces an even worse cataclysmic dying off. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how he sees it. Um, and he, he then talked about the tragedy of the commons. I don't think, guys, let me ask you one quick question because I want to move on from this in a moment, but I, I don't want to move on too quickly. Did we talk about the tragedy of the commons from Garrett Hardin? Or is that something that I think like, was the last note on the whole reproduction rate thing? If so, then I want to tell you at least about the tragedy of the commons before I close this review of Garrett Hardin. Tragedy of the commons, anybody? I don't think so. Okay, yeah, thank you then. So let me go back over that. Um, <clears throat> this is maybe one of the most well-known ideas or concepts in the writings of Garrett Hardin. Um, it's kind of almost like an economic principle, and he applies it to his ethical uh, argument here. The tragedy of the commons is just this idea that with public resources, according to this thought, they're doomed to failure. They're bound to fail because they get overutilized and they're poorly maintained. So unlike private resources. So that's the tragedy of the commons. Public resources inevitably fail due to um, overuse. and poor maintenance, and that's unlike private resources. Okay, public resources fail due to overuse, poor maintenance, and that's unlike private resources. This is the tragedy of the commons in a simple, concise statement. Um, the word commons is being used to refer to a publicly available resource, a resource that people can take from without limits because it's not restricted who can access it. So it's not exclusive to a certain group of people. It's just open to the public. And the author, Ger Garrett Hardin, is advising us against um, using or having public resources because he says they're bound to fail for the reasons mentioned here. He gives an example to try and make the point. The example he gives is, suppose there was one acre of farmland, okay, so land that's available for grazing farm animals on. Suppose that this one acre of land is open to the public. So who then will come with their farm animals to use the acre? Everybody, because why wouldn't they? If it's open to the public, 
There's no reason for people who have any needs in terms of grazing area to not use it. So he says, here's a, what you would predictably expect. Everyone will flood into the zone of this one acre with their farm animals and stuff, and then there will be too many animals for it to support. It'll get overgrazed, and it'll basically ruin the acre of land. Um, will, will any of these members of the public who are bringing their animals to the public acre do their best job to clean up after themselves, make it tidy and sustainable for the long haul? No, because first of all, those that are there using it are using a public resource, so they don't have any kind of personal investment into it. Therefore, um, there's no matching feeling of personal responsibility to its sustainability. Now, if the one acre was private though, he says, it would never get overused and poorly maintained and therefore ruined because if you're the private owner, you have every vested reason because you spent your own money um, on this acre of land. You have every reason not to allow it to get overutilized because if it does and it gets ruined, you're the one who has now lost the value of your personal investment. So a private owner is not gonna put like a million cows or pigs on this acre overutilizing it and ruining its ability to support any number of animals. Um, also, the private owner makes sure that the thing they own is reasonably well maintained and kept up because if it isn't, then they are the one who it reflects poorly on their ownership and they're the one who has to live with this wasted or depleted resource. Think of public or private restrooms. I mean, at least for me, uh, you know, in some of the men's restrooms that we sometimes see, publicly, they're oftentimes quite dirty. And the reason is because if it's a member of the public using it, there's not their restroom per se. So they don't feel too bad about like throwing paper towel on the ground or something. But you would never do that in your own home because then you would have to live with the mess and also it would reflect poorly on you as the owner. So, you know, his example is of the one acre of land. I'm just kind of giving you some other angles to look at it. The basic bottom line, though, is public resources don't do well because everyone uses them and no one takes care of them. But private resources do fine because the owner that's the private owner makes sure to ensure the sustainability of their own investment in the future. So why does he mention this tragedy of the commons? Because he thinks it's one reason to advise against um, supporting initiatives like the World Food Bank. The World Food Bank was a new idea back in the 70s. It's been around for a while. It is a humanitarian international program where first world nations will contribute from their surplus uh, resources to the World Food Bank and then poor nations of the world could draw from it according to their needs. It's a humanitarian idea, but he thinks it's just another commons that's bound to fail again. And why is that? Because in this case, the commons is the access to the internationally given food and resources from the first world to the third world. Um, but he says this commons will also be abused and mismanaged because it will be drawn from by the poor nations without limitation, but they'll do nothing to wean themselves off of it by moderating their reproductive rates and over time becoming a first world economy. So he thinks this is really just going to enlarge the size of those populations to such a point where inevitably it'll become um, impractical to sustain the program. And then we will just have a larger cohort of poor people and the same problem of hunger. So um, that's why he doesn't like the idea of the World Food Bank. He also mentions in passing that he thinks Big businesses and private interests are the real beneficiaries of some of these systems. For example, rail and shipment companies that have to distribute the food from the donors to the recipients, the administrators of the bureaucracy that staffs and administers the aid through those agencies also have a vested interest in perpetuating that bureaucracy, even if it's not necessarily to the benefit of the third world. And he also talks about how with um, uh, Advocacy for very permissive immigration controls could be based on businesses, big businesses that want to have cheap labor or to be able to hire workers that would not do otherwise degrading work that Americans are not usually willing to do, like janitorial services and things of that kind, um, agricultural, farm work and stuff like that. So I don't know. Um, he tries to consider a few objections, but in my opinion, he didn't do a very good do job of, of rebutting the objections. Like in one case, he mentions a famous Chinese proverb, I guess, where people have said, um, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day, teach a man how to fish and he'll eat for the rest of his days. So someone might say to Hardin, okay, if your problem is just giving people food aid and you think that just puts a bandaid on the issue, why not give people technological aid and educational assistance so that they can make their own strides towards reaching a more developed economy and then being more self-sufficient? And I mean, I think that's a great objection, but he just, for whatever reason, kind of dismisses it out of hand and he says, oh, but it's still going to feed into the population overgrowth of those third world countries. So it's not a good idea. But I don't follow his logic there because I would have thought 
that the reason to give like technological and educational assistance would be so that they can make movement towards their own first world status. And in that case, the reproductive rates would decline in line with what we see in other first world countries. So I don't know, sometimes I think that he, uh, he helps himself to arguments and claims that he's not fully defending or not defending in total, totally adequately. In the end, he says, um, like he closes the paper by saying, oh, we can't remake the past. Maybe it's not entirely fair if you go back in time and you look at colonialism and like um, manifest destiny and all that. You know, there's a lot of things that are inequitable. But he says that's just the past. It can't be redone. We have to move into the future from where we are today instead of where we would have liked to have been today if things were more fair. Um, he says that basically his opponent who says we have a greater obligation to give aid is being overly idealistic and unrealistic. He says if you really wanted to be purely just and righteous, then wouldn't the moral thing be to return this land of the United States to indigenous and native American people because there was no moral basis for the transfer of ownership from them to colonial and European settlers. Uh, but nobody takes seriously the idea that, you know, we should um, abandon the current status quo and return this country to native and indigenous people. So he says then, um, even if it's perhaps unfair in some ways, uh, we're just born into these current status quo and set of facts. And so that's why he kind of, in the end, says there's no need or moral obligation to assist until we really are a, a spaceship planet where there is some kind of central and uh, global authority, then we should act instead on the lifeboat ethics. At least that's what he argues. Okay, so enough of that. Done for the moment with Garrett Hardin. There were some summary points that I had to add so that we didn't finish too fast, but now we're good. So I'm moving on to the next author, and this is the last essay uh, in the first half of the semester before we start preparing for our midterm. So one more paper. This is a paper by a mid-century American woman philosopher named Philippa Foote. No, I'm sorry, I, I'm getting her name mixed up because there's two authors. This is Judith Thompson, but she talks about Philippa Foote in her essay. So sorry for that slight slip, but it's Judith Jarvis Thompson. This is her name. <clears throat> Judith Jarvis Thompson, she's been around a long time. She was born in 1929 still living, and um, this is a paper she wrote in 1985, which is called The Trolley Problem. The Trolley Problem by Judith Thompson, 1985. Judith Jarvis Thompson is a very distinguished um, American woman philosopher who taught for decades at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, She's famous for her writings in the field of ethics, and um, she's well known for being able to creatively develop hypothetical scenarios and thought experiments to advance her arguments in, in her papers. Um, one paper that she wrote in 1971 has become a total classic in ethics literature, and it's about abortion. It's called A Defense of Abortion. That paper is one of a series of papers that were written by other philosophers, ethicists in the early 70s, which kind of led and helped to provide the, socio uh, the, the social and academic context for the Roe versus Wade decision of 1973. Her paper, Defense of Abortion, argues that abortion is morally permissible, and she tries to give you know, reasonable arguments towards that conclusion. But this paper has nothing to do with that particular topic. It's just about something else in ethics, just giving you some background on her. Because if you ever study like a contemporary ethics course, and like abortion is, is one of the moral debates that is studied and that's often seen in many of those kinds of classes, then you'd probably be ending up reading Judith Thompson on that at some point. But anyway, okay, so Judith Thompson, trolley problem. This essay explores um, puzzling intuitions that people have about killing versus letting die. And what Thompson basically points out is that we have confused and inconsistent intuitions about killing and letting die. Essentially, um, in scenarios where a person would say that it's wrong for one to either kill to save five, kill one to save a greater number, if we simply modify certain features of the example, we will elicit an opposite intuition from the same audience members, that now it's wrong for that same kind of action to be taken. So for us to disentangle and sort out and make clear our intuitions about killing and letting die, we study the trolley problem essay. Now the trolley problem essay does revolve around a series of highly inventive 
thought experiments <clears throat> and hypothetical scenarios. And um, as you guys have learned, that's a major aspect of philosophical writing. And in this paper, it really goes to extremes. So, you know, just buckle up because there's a lot of funny, interesting, fanciful thought experiments built into this paper. And that's, that's okay. So let's go on and start with the analysis. Um, so there's two hypothetical scenarios that we have to compare with each other in order to understand and present the trolley problem, so to speak. So here's one of those examples, and we were going to call it trolley driver. Trolley driver. Okay, so <clears throat> to make it even more memorable and easy to understand, I'm going to uh, draw some pictures up here of the scenario so you have a visual. Okay, so here's the deal. We've got this trolley, and there's a trolley going forward. In the trolley, we have this driver of the trolley. That's the trolley driver, and here's a little... I don't know, control panel and switch. The trolley's on a track. The track is ahead of the trolley like that. Now there's a problem, okay? On the trolley track, there's five people. There they are. This is not good because this trolley heading on towards these five people is on a direct course to hit them and kill all five, right? This is a trolley speeding at them. It's going to hit him, and um, that's going to be a lot of loss of life, which is a bad thing. So we would hope that there would be some kind of way to prevent these guys from getting hit. The, the unfortunate thing is that the trolley right now, the brakes are malfunctioning, so he can't seem to hit the brakes and stop it short so that it doesn't collide with them. So it looks like they're doomed. But wait, there is one option that he has. See, there's a fork in the trolley track, basically a fork in the road. And he has access to a switch here, which can divert the trolley from the first track to the other tangent, right? And if he does hit that switch, that's great, because then the trolley's not going to continue on this track. It's going to go off that direction. But there's still one little issue, though. There is one person up here on that other part of the track. But it's only one, okay? On this side, there's five. Up there, there's one. So suppose that he hits the switch, because there's nothing that can be done to stop the trolley. It's on a forward course. It can't be prevented from continuing on one of those two sides. So here's the question that is given. And just so you guys know, at the heart of this whole essay are these examples. And these examples and the questions that I'm going to ask you, you're not the first person who's been asked this question because these scenarios have been presented to thousands and thousands of people in different academic and research settings. The surveys are given and polls are taken of people uh, to ask them whether they think it would be okay or not okay morally for the driver to flip the switch. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Don't overthink it too much. Just give me a common sense reaction. If this trolley driver were to flip the switch so that it does not continue here and instead it hits that one, would that be okay or not? What do you think? Would that be morally permissible or not for him to simply take the action which prevents the greater death and greater loss of life. So that's my question. Is it okay for him? Is it morally permissible or not for him to flip the switch so that it no longer hits five people and instead it just hits one? So what do you think? Question for you. The question is, would that be okay or not? From your judgment, not asking anything about the law, is it, I mean, this is just a moral debate. So morally speaking, do you think it would be permissible or not for him to switch the trolley's track so that it doesn't hit five? Okay, Sebastian, say yes. Sydney, so <clears throat> uh, I got to say this. Um, the overwhelming reaction of almost all is that it is not wrong. So unfortunately, you're in a tiny minority. It's like way up in like the 90th percentile type range. And I would say that that is definitely the intuitive response of most all people who do who do hear this question. Now, you're saying, oh, because he takes an action to kill the one person. But look, he's already on a trolley driving it straight at five people, and his current action will kill five people. So it's kind of like, is he going to kill five or kill one? And when it's human life, you'd always hope to have minimized the loss of life. Um, Olga, you say, but then wouldn't him not making the decision mean that he chose to kill the five? Exactly right. So... He's going to be responsible for more death if he doesn't flip the switch. Um, 
If the driver thinks in a utilitarian perspective, then yes. But Dennis, I mean, think of it in just a humanitarian perspective. Do you really want five people to die? These people have lives. They have families. They have friends. They have hopes, dreams. That's five people. Now, it's a tragedy for one person to die. But can we really say that that's um, preferable for five to die instead of one? I mean, if he flips the switch, he's not doing anything wrong, most people think, just because... There's no question that the trolley is going to kill some number of people. The only remaining question is how many will the trolley kill? If he allows it to continue, then, then by his driving, the trolley will kill five. If he doesn't and he switches it, it's still a tragedy. No one wants to ever allow anybody to be killed through this type of action. But if, it's, if you're in a forced choice scenario and you have a bad set of options, he would just do the thing that's less worse, right? But what if the driver has a personal connection to that one person? Ah, yes. Well, we can't build those things into the example. Let me say something about that, Dennis, okay? Because, like, when I present this type of scenario, it's a philosophy essay. And so I always get that kind of – someone will say something like, well, why can't the people just get up and run away? Or, you know, um, we have to just control certain features of the hypothetical so that we don't get off the rails and start acting or start discussing factors that are extraneous to the moral questions that we're looking at. Obviously, if we complicate the issue a little bit and sort of build in, well, this is like, this is the president of the United States and these people are criminals. I mean, there's all kinds of weird ways that you could sort of try to finesse so that we get a different reaction. But without any further information, just knowing these are people, these are just human beings, not, not known to the trolley driver. But, you know, if we have a set of human beings, oh, off the rails, huh? Thanks, Cordy. I didn't even realize that. But yeah. Um, can you understand what I'm saying? Like, we, we can't play with the features of the scenario too much because if we do, then we will start talking about a whole different set of factors and another kind of scenario. So anyway, here's the bottom line. Most people feel that this is not wrong when the flip is switched. Um, and that's not just my opinion or yours. It's You can see it. I'm actually going to have you guys watch some video. Um, I'm going to send it around to Canvas. There, one of the editors of our textbook, Tamara Gendler, she is a philosophy professor at Yale. And there's a video of her giving a lecture on the trolley problem at Yale. And she has like one of those systems with a big auditorium class, like hundreds of students, where they can hit a clicker and give their instant reaction to a survey question. So like she presents the example, and then you see the bar graphs that show the percentiles of how people responded. And it is in the high like 90 percentile. People find this not to be wrong. And I mean, if you don't overcomplicate it too much, it seems like all the people are saying is no one wants more people to die. If, if the trolley is going to kill some people, no matter what, why would anyone think that it's wrong to try and just get it to kill fewer people? All right. So anyway, yeah. Um, <clears throat> not to worry, though. That's good. So oh, about what you're saying, Dennis, I, I, it's all good. I like these questions. So that's trolley driver. But here's the thing. The trolley problem involves a comparison of two cases. So sometimes when I teach this and I ask questions later on like tests, quizzes, whatever, well, we don't have quizzes, but tests, for example, like what's the trolley problem? This is the not the right answer. Someone says the trolley's out of control. It could hit five, but if you switch, it'll hit one. What should you do? Some people write that as the trolley problem, but that's not it. It's only like half of it. The real trolley problem is only seen after you give this second example case and you compare the way that the audiences respond to them. So we have to now talk about transplant, the other example, the other scenario. Now, the transplant scenario is actually something that we've talked about briefly earlier in the class. When we talked about utilitarianism, guys, and I said some people find fault with it because um, according to utilitarianism, you should do whatever creates the most overall human happiness. But what if that involved actions that violate fundamental rights, like, like if you kill one to save five by taking the organs? Well, anyway, that's the transplant scenario. So let me just put that on the table again. Here's five people. Just these little stick figures to give you a visual. Now, here's five people, and what's wrong with them is they each have a various type of vital organ that's failing, and they need a transplant to save their life. Maybe one person needs a heart transplant, kidney, lung, other kidney, liver. So they all need a different organ, a different bodily organ. And if they don't receive it, then pretty soon they'll succumb to their ailment, and they will die. Now, they go to the doctor. Here, let's say this is the doctor guy. And they're asking him, can you find us a donor somewhere? Now, here's another thing to add to the scenario. These five people, they all have the same kind of very rare blood type. Let's say just by the sake of discussion that it's triple X blood, okay? Triple X blood, they all have that. 
and it's a very rare and distinctive blood type, so it's not easy to find a donor. Now, maybe you're thinking in your mind, but how do all five of them have it if it's that rare? It's a coincidence, so that's that. Anyway, so these five people have the super rare blood type triple X. The doctor's trying to find some type of donor for them. He's looking through the list, looking, 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 scouring the available records. It's just not happening. Nobody out there seems to have the matching blood type, so he can't find a suitable donor, and he's going to have to tell him he thinks, sorry, guys, I'm, so I'm very sorry, but nothing can be done. I can't find a person. But right as he's preparing to do that, in off of the street walks a nice, healthy, young person like you, right? That's you, or not that to be you, but it's a young person like you, okay? They come in, and they don't even have, like, any major health problems at all. They're actually just going to the doctor for, like, a routine annual physical just to make sure everything's okay, you know, kind of proactively going to the doctor. So anyway, this person's in there, and he's got a free moment before he goes back to speak to them. So he just looks at the person's medical chart. Now, if you guys are those kind of, like, you know, avid film goers or you're, you're really precise and um, insightful when you read novels, you can sometimes in, in anticipate the next plot point. Maybe you know where this is going, right? So he looks at this guy's chart just to see what's up, and what do you think he sees? Lo and behold, ah, wouldn't you know it, this guy, what do you think I'm going to tell you? What do we discover? What does this doctor transplant surgeon discover about the one healthy young patient that's walked in? Just see if you can follow that, and then I'll continue with our scenario. <clears throat> Yeah, so he does have that rare blood type, exactly, yes, he's got the triple X. So, in our doctor's mind, he's thinking, hmm, well, I mean, actually, this guy matches the blood type. And here's the thing, I told you that they all need a different organ, so you don't really need five donors. If you had one donor match, then basically that person could be, you know, gutted and all the different organs could be split off into five and save all five. So really, in, in case you had a donor match, one person would be sufficient to provide all the organs. So he's talking to the guy now. And he says, um, <clears throat> so, sir, let me just ask you a really random question. And this is not going to be a normal type of discussion, but I just want to throw it out there, okay? So, look, in the next ward, we've got five people that are all suffering from all these different types of organ failures. And um, just as chance would have it, they all have the same rare blood type. And I could not find a donor for them, so I was just about to tell them, I'm sorry. And, you guys, there's nothing that I can do. It's uh, sad, but I can't find a donor. You're going to probably pass away from those diseases. But then you came in, and it's almost like divine intervention. You came in, and I'm looking at your medical information, and as it turns out, you have that blood type. So, look, uh, let me just level with you and ask what you would want or think. Would it be, would you be okay if I were to take all the organs out of your body, give them to those five people? Now, if I do that, let's just be straightforward. That you would not survive. We're talking about taking all these vital organs out of your body. So you'd you would die, unfortunately. But Five people would live, and that's five, and you're one. And so, I mean, if I don't do this, if you don't let me do this, you're going to survive, but they're all going to die. And so that's a net loss of four human beings compared to the alternative. Um, so what do you think? Would you be okay with that? I mean, you'd be like a real hero to them, and more people will live. Um, now, look, if this guy, this young, healthy person, is anything like me or you, then you already know what they're going to say. No way. Of course not. No, I'm sorry I don't accept. You know, I got my own life to live. I'm sorry they're sick but I have every right to my organs and my body. And um, even if you could save more people by taking them out, you know, it's absolutely wrong and I, I, I refuse. Now, here's the question. At that point, <clears throat> what if the transplant surgeon just is like, okay, well then let's go. And he just kills him and takes the organs by force and gives them to the five people. Would that be okay or not? Now, I hope that this one's even maybe easier for us to just come to a consensus about, but if the transplant surgeon kills this man to take his organs and save five lives, is this okay or is this wrong? What do you think, permissible or impermissible? Scenario two, transplant, we're changing the case. So I have a new question about this case. If this was done, is it okay? And Cordy, yes, it's not okay. I hope that we can all just come to the right conclusion here. It's, it's clearly wrong, I mean, and if you feel that it's wrong and it's not okay, you're in great company. Because again, that's like the universal response of almost everybody. So. Here's the state of play. Audiences presented with trolley driver overwhelmingly say it's okay for him to flip the switch. Audiences presented with transplant overwhelmingly say it is not okay for him to kill the one to save these five. So now the trolley problem starts to come into focus. Here's the problem. It's a question. It's simply this question. Why, though, do most people react to these cases differently? Why is it that most people say this is fine but not this? 
And the reason that that is a puzzle is because if you look beyond the, the surface differences on the two cases, there are some structural similarities in them, right? So what are the similarities? Well, in both cases, there are five people that are imminently at risk of death. And there's one person who's on the scene who, if they intervene, in the, if, if they intervene that will be an action that will lead to the death of one, but would prevent the death of the five. In this trolley driver example, everyone seems to think that if this driver intervenes, taking an action that would lead to this one person's death and prevent the death of the five, this is okay. But in the transplant scenario, if this surgeon intervenes, taking an action that leads to his death, preventing the death of five, nobody thinks that's okay. So why is it okay for the one driver to intervene and save five at the cost of one, but it's not okay for transplant surgeon to intervene and save five at the cost of one. That is the so-called trolley problem. So it's a problem in terms of explaining why we react differently to the two cases, given that they both bear some basic similarities, like a one versus five scenario is both, but only in one of them do people have the general intuition that it's okay to do that and not the other. So that is our question. Now, has anyone ever solved this trolley problem? Okay, well, in the end of this essay, Thompson's going to say what she thinks the right solution is. But she's going to hold us in suspense because first she wants to tease us with a couple of failed solutions that she thinks other people have given. And she wants to ultimately try and explain why those solutions, so-called, do not really get to the bottom of the to the answer of why people react differently. Okay, so you've seen the cases. You've seen the little, you know, cartoons I've drawn up here. Next, I want to talk to you about one attempted solution to the problem that she says, sorry, but it actually doesn't, doesn't answer the question. So basically understand here's where we are at. She's going to refer us to a attempted solution of this problem by another author, present what their attempted solution is, and then afterwards try and explain why it actually doesn't solve the problem. Okay. So there was another mid-century woman American philosopher who talked about the trolley problem before Thompson. In fact, she's not the original author to speak about this so-called dilemma. The first author to ever present the trolley problem scenario was this woman named Philippa Foote, another philosopher of the 20th century. Very weird and interesting name, Philippa Foote. So like Thompson writes in 1985 about the trolley problem, but if you go back like 20 years or 30 years in the 50s and 60s, Philippa Foote talked about it initially. Philippa Foote thought she solved it, and so here is Foote's solution. So Foote says, I've, I've figured out why people react differently here, and it's because there are two true moral principles that everyone seems to find agreement with, and if these two principles are, are correct and true, then that would explain the different reactions that people have. So... Here are the two principles that Foote mentions. First of all, that it is worse to kill five than to kill one. Okay, so she says no one would, would disagree with this. Because killing is bad. Everyone knows killing is bad. It's one of the worst things anyone could ever do. But the numbers matter. So more is worse than less. So if a person was to kill, I think we could all agree that if we had to pick, we would prefer that the person not kill five and rather kill one. So killing one is bad, but killing five even worse. So um, just consider that as a true principle, perhaps. Now below, we have this second principle. And the second one says that it is worse to kill one than to let five die. So what this says is that killing is so bad that it's worse to take action that causes death to, for someone to die by your hand or by your action. That's worse than to just allow five people to die by not intervening to prevent their death. Okay, so like, if five people die, but not because of you, but rather because they already had something going on that was going to kill them and you didn't stop it, it would be worse for you to actually 
actively kill a person than to allow five people to die of their own accord. So if these two principles are true, Philippa Foot thought it solves the problem because let's consider the choice situation of the driver versus the transplant surgeon. The driver in the example chooses between killing five or killing one because if his trolley continues, then he's going to be the person who plowed into five people with his trolley that he's driving and he would kill five. But if he flips the switch, then the number of people that the trolley kills with him at the wheel is one instead of five. So it seems as though when he flips the switch, he's just trying to do the thing that is less worse, right? If he continues on, that would be worse than the result that would happen if it just hits one because it's kill five or kill one. And why would one think that it's better for five to die rather than one if it's killing? But on the other hand, the transplant surgeon, what is his choice? Let me ask you that. And let's get that in the chat. Tell me if you think, what is the choice of the transplant surgeon? So clearly if he does kill one person, that's one of his alternatives. But if he doesn't kill that person, right? If he doesn't kill the one healthy young person, then has he killed the other five if they die of their organ failure? Tell me what's the choice of the transplant surgeon? Because if you consider what would kill the five people, it's not quite the same as him being responsible for it, is it? But let me just see you say it one time so, I'm cl so that I'm clear that you know what I mean. The choice of the surgeon as opposed to the choice of the driver. It's what versus what in the example. Well, he hasn't killed the five, right. But uh, I was going to ask it as a disjunction. What are the two choices? Say it as an either or. He could either blank or blank. I think you kind of understand based on what you wrote as a comment, but I want to say, see it clearly in the chat. The choice situation of the transplant surgeon. Well, no, but write it though. <clears throat> or not necessarily you, but anybody can write this either or sentence. Choice of the surgeon, I'm setting you up. I mean, it should not, you should know. He could either kill the healthy person. Well, yeah, but uh, that's not a disjunction. You say to save five, that's not the word or. Yeah, kill one or let five die, correct, Sydney. So the surgeon, if they kill a person, then they're dead because of the surgeon's act of homicide. If the surgeon doesn't do any of that, then five people die, but not because of a surgeon, because of whatever natural causes and illnesses that they have concerning organ failure, right? So it looks like for the surgeon anyway, killing is worse than just standing back and letting people die of whatever problems they have. Um, well, it, it, Cordy, it is letting five die because he's not doing whatever is necessary to stop their death. So he's just letting it happen as it would have happened. I mean, you say it was going to happen, but not if he kills somebody and takes their organs. So he's letting the natural course of events play out. But in life sometimes, we don't let people die of their illnesses when we have a moral means of preventing it, right? If someone was going to die, if they didn't receive triple bypass surgery on their heart, and we just said, I'm not going to operate on them. Well, it wouldn't be you killing them in that case either, but it would be letting the person die because you didn't take every available measure to avert that outcome. So let's not overthink it too much. The case of the transplant surgeon is certainly a killing a person or not doing anything and then five people die of illnesses that they already have. I kind of know what you mean though, Cordy. You're like, well, why is he described as letting them die? I mean, uh, but I guess it's because he's a doctor who has the immoral option to murder a person to stop it. Okay, so it's like murder people or let those guys die. Letting them die is not that is not bad in comparison to killing someone. So this says that when you when everyone finds it wrong what the surgeon would do, they have every legitimate reason to say that because what they're reacting to is the principle that it's a bad thing to kill. Causing death is way worse than just not intervening to stop it when it was already going to happen. But when people say that it's okay for the trolley driver to intervene, they see it differently. His choice is I'm killing more or I'm killing less. And so it's better to kill less rather than more. But again, the surgeon isn't choosing between killing more or less because if the more people die, it's not through killing. It's through something that's that they've already got. So it seems like it's a pretty effective set of principles that might solve the problem. But Judah Thompson, she's just teasing us. She says, ah, not so fast. I'm snatching that solution away. So she's going to next show us why this Philippa Foot solution does not actually solve the problem. And she says it doesn't solve the problem because if we simply make a slight adjustment or slight edit to the original trolley case, 
the problem comes back from the dead, it revives, it, it reappears, and it shows that it still remains. So Thompson says, consider this while we modify the trolley scenario just a bit. So we're now going to change the trolley driver to what's called bystander at the switch. So here's a new version of our trolley hypothetical. We'll call it bystander at the switch. So as before, we have a trolley, which is on a forward course, moving at a great velocity towards a set of people on the track and not capable of being removed from it. It's going to kill them if it continues on that path. Um, as before, there's a fork in the track, and on that other side, there is one person. Now, in bystander at the switch, though, we have a little different thing. The difference is this. The driver is incapacitated. I'm putting X's where his eyes should be. He's passed out, and he's unconscious. Also, no one else on the trolley can possibly gain access to the control room where he is, so no one has the ability to flip this switch. So that means it looks like without the ability to flip the switch and an incapacitated driver, we're bound to hit the five. But there is actually one thing that could be done to prevent it. See, we have a bystander standing by. Say this is just someone walking around in the area, taking a nice stroll, and what they notice as they're walking is a switch. This remote switch is clearly marked and labeled as such. It says, emergency track diversion switch, use in case of need to switch trolley trajectory. Now, it's a hypothetical. You need to pretend, whether it's realistic or not, that these facts and the functioning of the switch are totally understood by the bystander. So, the bystander is present on the scene. The driver can't do anything, but the bystander has access to this switch. So, if it is the bystander who could flip the switch, causing the trolley to no longer to head towards five, and instead to head towards one, now the question is given again to the audience. In bystander at the switch, do people think that it's okay or not okay for the bystander to flip the switch? And, you know, we're running low on time in the class meeting. You can think about your own intuitions here, but I'll just tell you what the overwhelming majority response is of almost all people who've been polled by this type of question. And almost everybody says the same thing as before, that this hasn't changed their feeling about whether it's okay. It's okay for the bystander to flip the switch just as much as the driver themselves. Um, so that does not seem to make people think now it's wrong because it's a bystander, oh, now it's wrong. People have the same general response. It's the same outcome of preventing the greater amount of death and destruction through the diversion of the trolley to the other path. So basically, long story short, in the driver scenario, everyone thought it was okay to switch the switch. In the bystander scenario, people have the same basic reaction. They don't feel that that's any different morally. But with bystander replacing driver, we no longer can use Foote's solution because the bystander has a choice situation that is now parallel to the transplant surgeons. What is the choice now that's facing our bystander? Well, if he hits the switch, then he causes the trolley to move in this direction, and then he intervenes, causing the death of the one, so he would essentially kill the one. But if he refuses to touch this switch and stays uninvolved, like I'm not going to be a part of this, then the trolley will go towards five. But in that case, is he the killer? No. In that case, he's letting them die from the oncoming trolley because he doesn't intervene to stop it from going in that direction. So now it looks like the choice facing our bystander is exactly identical to the choice facing the surgeon, kill one or let five die. But yet people don't see this as wrong and they do see the transplant surgeon's action as wrong. So the real trolley problem now is this is a specific question. Why is it that everybody who's surveyed says that it's permissible for bystander to act, but impermissible for transplant surgeon to act? And we're not yet there to the solution, so I'm going to hold you in suspense. Stay tuned until Friday. Then we will talk about um, how Thompson ultimately tries to solve this dilemma and what she thinks the correct principle is that solves it. So anyway, guys, thanks so much. You know, this trolley problem stuff, if you want to watch uh, some kind of pop cultural context on it, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the show The Good Place. It's a pretty popular sitcom right now. Um, and it's a good thing for philosophers and students of ethics because the main character, Chidi, he's a moral philosopher. So they always kind of drop references to like utilitarianism, Kantianism. And there's an episode about the trolley problem where they actually go through the trolley problem with Chidi and whoever, Ted Dance and the other main character. Um, and there's also all kinds of funny memes about the trolley problem. I don't know if any of you guys like memes or find them funny. 
there's some of them quite nihilistic, but they're very philosophical and funny too. On the Facebook group, Trolley Problem Memes, just a nonstop stream of hilarious content. They riff on the examples here. They give like a like a million different varieties of uh, variations on it. So yeah. Anyway, guys, um, thanks again for your attendance this morning. I don't want to keep you too much later, but um, I'll be in touch in the next couple of days with your study guide for the midterm. Over the weekend, I'll have your grades ready for the first essay, and we'll be back on Friday to finish up the uh, trolley problem. Okay, so everyone's good. Let me know in the chat if you are, and if so, then I can close the stream, and we'll be back in a few days. So we're good to go. All right, then. Thanks again, everybody. Yeah, no, it's true, Dennis. It's a great show for philosophy and for students of ethics. You can kind of tap into it a little more. But all right, guys, thanks again, and I will certainly see you in a few days. All right, bye. <clears throat>